evening, ladies, and welcome to the February edition of the podcast for Digging Deep in God's Word. We're really excited that you're here, and Emily's here with me again yep. tonight. Hello. I always love to have Emily because <laughs> she is a digger, and uh, she's really uh, just so down-to-earth and practical in the applications of the Scriptures, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I did want to begin tonight by... Um, Emily's going to lead us in a prayer in a minute. I want you to remember, Emily, to include our nation as we've um, hopefully all already gone and cast our votes today. And yes. we, we are in a grave and somber time in our nation. And today, of course, was uh, 12 to 13, depending on how you look at it. States were divide, uh, deciding delegates mm -hmm. today. And so this is a huge day in the history of our nation and could have a great impact on how we are viewed in the next uh, generation even mm -hmm. as Christians, as followers of God. So we want to be very prayerful about that. We're welcome to the month of March. So you'll be studying Jeremiah this month. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to be prayerful too about our upcoming study. March came in here in <laughs> Alabama like a lion. Right. So I think that the saying is it comes in like a lion. It goes out like a, a lamb. lamb. It is storming in Alabama today. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where you are. You might be uh, somewhere all the way around the world listening to this. But wherever you are, we are sisters in Christ, and we have a great bond. And as we study Nehemiah, I, I say this every time, but I love the book of Nehemiah. I do too. I love this book. I think that he is so very practical mm -hmm. for us as we face... Uh, tribulation, as we face mockery, as we face treason within the ranks. Mm -hmm. As I studied him, I was just impressed with his get down to business attitude. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get rid of the discouragement and no matter what is occurring around us, we're going to go ahead and build this mm -hmm. wall. And I, I, I want to go ahead and say this before Emily prays. We, I counted up today uh, the, the prayers in the book of Nehemiah. It's a short book, 13 chapters, and we have 10 instances of prayer recorded mm -hmm. in those 13 chapters. And I love that fact. He never proceeded without prayer, but once he had prayed to God, he was determined to do the right thing. And I love that about mm -hmm. him. Let's start with our prayer, and then we'll get into our <clears throat> lesson. Right. Father, we are so thankful um, to be gathered together um, across many countries and states um, to study your word together and to grow together and to learn truth and put it in our hearts. And Father, we, <clears throat> we thank you for um, this wonderful book that we have in your word. Nehemiah is just an amazing example to us, and we pray that we can be more like him, that we can be as prayerful as he was, that we can work like he did, and and just uh, what an amazing example to us, especially in our time. It's just so relevant to us, Father. Father, we are extremely mindful today of the elections that are going on and the state of our nation, Father. Um, it, it appears hopeless sometimes. It appears as though things are just falling apart, but we know that you are in control and we pray for good outcomes today and that ultimately your will will be done. And whatever happens, Father, we will glorify you in, and we will be willing to stand for the truth, um, whatever comes our way. But, Father, we just pray for good outcomes today. Uh, be with us as we study and um, just watch over those who are, who are listening. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, Emily. Um, you know, you were praying that sometimes it looks hopeless mm -hmm. in our nation. And I think about Nehemiah being a cupbearer, a mm -hmm. servant to a foreign king in captivity and thinking about the destruction that had gone on in his homeland and how unlikely, how <laughs> unlikely was it that this foreign king, Artaxerxes, was going to let 
Nehemiah go back and lead a restoration right. of the, those walls. And mm -hmm. I really want us to view those walls and the restoration of them symbolically mm -hmm. and to think about that God, our God can restore. Mm -hmm. And he has the power to put men in whatever positions he wants them to be in. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, Nehemiah, we're going to kind of chronicle this, but all of a sudden he's down there in a foreign land, a cupbearer to the king, mourning over the shape of Jerusalem's walls and the shape of the, the city and the uh, encroachments that have been going on by the enemies. He's, he's mourning all of that. And then all of a sudden he has the money that he needs, <laughs> the men that he needs, the letters that he needs, giving him permission. And he is fully subsidized by this foreign anti-God government yes. to go and do what needs to be done for Jehovah God. And if that's not encouraging to us as God's people, we need to stop with the hopelessness and realize that if it is God's will, it can occur. Mm -hmm. And even if it is not God's will for our nation to continue and if the enemies of God prevail in this nation, America, we are part of God's nation, yeah. his spiritual Israel. And so from our discussion tonight, I hope we can take heart yeah. to realize and put in the hearts of our children that we have already won at the tomb when Jesus mm -hmm. came out. We've already won. And so whatever happens to us, in this life is just so very temporary and we are right. victorious eternally. So um, I hope we can take that. Now, you and I talked about this yesterday. Tell the ladies, if in case there's someone who doesn't know, when was the book of Nehemiah written? What era? We did talk about this. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yes. You know. um, e well, well, you don't have to give a year. <laughs> uh, we talked about it um, being not far from Esther. Um, and really it, should... If we chronologically did the Old Testament, we're mm -hmm. going to put him at Malachi. Yes, right. Because he really was contemporary with Malachi. Right. Because so, you, you had mentioned maybe should have been chronologically the last book yeah. in the Old Testament. Yeah, because so. it was the final building of the wall before... Malachi finally was silenced, and there was that 400-year period of mm -hmm. silence. So, you know, sometimes we think about Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. We think about him sometimes because he was, his book was before Psalms. We mm -hmm. think about, you know, David or something, but he right. was way after David. He was... Um, you know, Esther happened during the book of Ezra, mm -hmm. and Ezra was in some ways contemporary with Nehemiah, mm -hmm. and they rebuilt this first, uh, you know, Ezra rebuilt the city, and then Nehemiah goes and rebuilds the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and Malachi's message is, is contemporary right. with Nehemiah. He is calling out to these Jews of the city of Jerusalem, and condemning some of the same things that we see Nehemiah mm -hmm. talking about, the sins that we see him talking about in the latter part of the book okay. of Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. So that's where it belongs. And as I think about Nehemiah, I did read this, and I thought it was very interesting, that Nehemiah's king was Artaxerxes. Mm -hmm. That was the king right. to whom he was cupbearer. And Artaxerxes was the son of Esther's husband, king. Mm -hmm. So Esther was sort of Nehemiah's, uh, um, Artaxerxes' stepmom. Mm -hmm, right. And so it could be that Esther, you know, she used her power right. for some really important she things. Did. And she was able to get the ear of the king. And, you know, as, as a result of her getting his ear, um, that's when Mordecai was exalted to um, a very prestigious position in Persia. And... Who knows but what Esther was the reason that mm -hmm. Nehemiah had this job as cupbearer to the king. It very well could, could have been. been. Mm -hmm. Cupbearer to the king was a, a coveted position. It was sort of like, uh, you and I were talking about this yesterday, it was sort of like being the butler to the president of the United <laughs> States. It's somebody who got to actually be in the presence mm -hmm. of royalty and obviously talk to the king mm -hmm. because we see early in the book of Nehemiah that um, 
he actually conversed with the king, and the king even knew how he was feeling. Right. I think you were that saying was, something. That else. was that I, I uh, that really stood out to me that he even cared. Um, how Nehemiah, how Nehemiah was, was feeling. And it, it had to be, too. I thought about this today. It had to be that Nehemiah was a happy person. Because yeah. if he had just been a somber person or didn't... Um, I, I picture Nehemiah as somebody who made the king feel good. Mm-hmm. Because all of a sudden, there was this one day when the king said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and, you know, it had to be a person of um, a happy personality. Mm-hmm. Or the king wouldn't have noticed that. Right. You know, we work or are around people in our spheres that if they're not happy, we know it. (laughs) And because they're usually happy. And he recognized that that something was wrong with Nehemiah. So the book begins in chapter 1. And this is a a kind of, I want to say Hanani, but but this really was Hanani, who was... um, Nehemiah's brother who reported to him Mm -hmm. Nehemiah wanted to know how things were in Jerusalem and so what was his report in chapter 1 that um, things were not good that uh, the the survivors he says the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire okay so this was a bad report that Hanani gave to Nehemiah about the state of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah then was sad before the king in chapter 2. And the king said, what's wrong with you? And Nehemiah told him that he had to be sad because his home city of Jerusalem, the place where, you know, by this time we know that this is going to be the city of Jerusalem. of the Messiah. This is going mm-hmm. to be David's city. And so he was, Nehemiah was sad because of the, the walls and the state of the city. And so this foreign king of Persia then said, what would you have me to do for you? And what did Nehemiah <laughs> answer? He said, um, well, first he prayed <laughs> before mm-hmm. he answered, mm-hmm. which also he stood out to me. Prayed. Um, he prayed. T- but that he took that moment before he answered the king Um, And he said, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor, um, he asked him to send him to Judah. Well, first he prayed that he could rebuild (laughs) before Mm -hmm. he answered, Mm -hmm. which also stood out to me. Um, But that he took that moment before he answered the king. And and he said, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor, um, he asked him to send him to Judah. Well, first he prayed that he could rebuild before he answered, which also stood out to me. But that he took that moment before he answered the king. And he said, if it pleases right. the king, and if your servant has found favor, um, he asked him to send him to Judah. I, well, first I mean, he prayed that he could rebuild <laughs> before he answered, <laughs> which also he stood out to me. Um, he t- but that he took that moment before he answered the king. Right. Um, and he said, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor, um, he asked him to send him to Judah. Well, first he prayed that he could rebuild before he answered, which also stood out to me. But that he took that moment before he answered. Answered, the king, right? Um, and he I said, if it pleases right. the king, and if your servant has found favor, um, he asked him to send him to Judah. Well, well first he prayed that he could rebuild <laughs> before he answered, <laughs> which I'm also he stood out to me. Pray, um, he took, but that he took that moment before he answered the king, right? And he said, if it pleases the king, and if your servant... ...which we live, we should pray when we're alone, and it's not the moment for our forgiveness for our bravery, for, the, for God to remember us when those moments come, like Nehemiah did in one, and then like he did in two, when those mm-hmm. moments come, we say quick prayers, God, here is my opportunity. Help me right, right now. Yeah. We should do that with regard to evangelism. We should do that with regard to counseling situations mm-hmm. when people ask us questions, and I do that all the time. I yeah. think, oh, this is a this is a hard question. And I say, Lord, give me wisdom. Help me to mm-hmm. answer this in the way that you would have me to. Yeah. And so that's what Nehemiah did. And then in the second place, I think this shows us that Nehemiah's reputation in Persia was good. Mm. The king the king wanted him to be happy. He wanted to please Nehemiah. And 
I just think that that says a lot about the relationship that the king had on the throne with right. this little cupbearer. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah had impressed the king. And I, I think about other books where that happened. Well, I was going to say, someone in our study last night brought up um, Joseph, um, you know, and the cupbearer being the one that said to Pharaoh, you know, so he was obviously in a position that Pharaoh would have taken advice from him and said, hey, I know this guy. From this cupbearer. From this cupbearer. And also you think about, and you know, these aren't necessarily the same positions, but you think about um, Daniel, you know, he was in a foreign land in captivity right. and he had the favor of, right, the, king. of the king. And then you think about um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. They definitely um, had the favor of the king. He was not happy to right. have them destroyed. And so right. we can, in whatever situations we find ourselves, and if we find ourselves at one point, and Paul, I think about Paul in the New Testament, um, when he was on yeah. the shipwreck, mm -hmm. and the captain of that ship, said, no matter what happens now, let's let Paul live. <laughs> let's let's listen make to sure Paul. we right. listen to him. Right. And so he did not want, he didn't want Paul to be killed. He didn't, he wanted Paul's safety because Paul had instructed him correctly. Mm -hmm. So if we're people of integrity and we stand by the word and don't, aren't flim flamming is uh, for lack of a better word, we are consistently staying in the word. There are going to be people who respect us for that. Right. And we're going to have opportunities to be influential. And I think that that's something that we really learned from Nehemiah. So, yes. so he went back, he had a three day inspection of the walls and mm -hmm. he mourned about those walls. Mm -hmm. He was sad about those walls. And then he had a conference with the elders and the priests about rebuilding the walls, and then they just got started. I, prayers are mm -hmm. all through here, but they just got yes. started, and they built against opposition. Now, Emily, who were the main people who opposed? Sanballat and Tobiah. Yeah, and there was one other guy there that's there listed at one time um, and who was also... Um, I think he's listed maybe one other time in the Nisham. book. Yeah. yeah, and I think maybe at the, towards the end of the book somewhere he's listed again. But yeah, and he was an Arabian, but it's primarily Sambala right. and Tobiah. Tobiah. And those people, verse uh, 19 of chapter 2, laughed us to scorn. Mm -hmm. They really made fun of them for mm -hmm. trying to rebuild these walls. And so we'll talk more about that. But they were building against opposition, and at one time, they even were building against threats and anger and uh, he had to divide up those people in the in the rebuilding and mm -hmm. put some of them as guards and some of them as right. builders and then some of the builders even it says were building with one hand and holding the sword right. with the other hand yeah. doing both so he rebuilt those walls though in an incredibly short time of <laughs> 52, 52 days. days yeah so that was just pretty amazing we need to realize that uh, with God, we can do things and we can do them efficiently. Yeah, despite all the, I mean, all, all of this mm. that they tried to, you know, stop him. He's still, I mean, in 52 yeah. days. It, and that is done. so uh, reminiscent to me of the New Testament when we get over to Acts 2 and the persecution yes. that was happening at the mm -hmm. with the church and Acts 3 to 5, the uh, every persecution, every trial, just it seemed like bring it on because the more you persecute, the more people <laughs> the are going to baptize. You know? right, I right. mean, it just seemed like that right. was the case. And so we need to take heart from that. You know, mm -hmm. persecution might not be such a bad, a bad thing. thing. And right. so we, we need to take heart from that. So they built against the opposition and then they got ready to dedicate the wall and they read the law. And I love that part of the book because um, the people mourned because they, mm -hmm. they had forgotten the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the commentaries that I read said that even they had been mixed with these other nations for so long in Jerusalem, in the city mm -hmm. of David, that their dialect was even different mm -hmm. than the law that right. was written originally, the law of Moses. And so they had to, remember, they had to give the sense right. of the law. Of the law. And so I thought that was really interesting that they made sure the people understood it. Mm -hmm. And we'll read, we'll talk a little bit more about that because yeah. there are some powerful passages mm -hmm. about the effect that the law had on right. them. So they read the law, they explained it. The people repented of their sins because they had, there were several um, large 
departures that we read about. They weren't keeping the Sabbath. They weren't keeping the Feast of Booths. Right. Um, they, they really had departed from the law and forgotten right. what the law said. And, and you think about not keeping the Sabbath. And, that's you know, a that's one of the Ten big Commandments. One. <laughs> right, that's you a big one. you think that they would know those Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. but they were the people of God, you would think. But so they repented, and then we they entered into a, a covenant anew with Jehovah, mm -hmm. and then they uh, dedicated that wall, and it seems that then was when Nehemiah left, and I think, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I, I read that that was about a year and a half, Right. That he was away. And then he went back and he was sad again. Mm -hmm. And what was that? Because um, they were falling back into um, sins that they, they knew better. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the, 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 how far they had fallen yeah. because they had taken in the enemies. Right. And they were allowing the enemies to, they were cozying up to oh, yeah. Sanballat and Tobiah and... So Nehemiah once again mourned, mm -hmm. and I love the last chapter because Nehemiah yeah. kept saying, but Lord, remember me. Remember me with your grace and know that I'm not part of this. Right. And I sometimes pray that to God about our country, America. I sometimes pray, God, you must be so disappointed right. in the people of our nation. And although they're not, it's not truly a Christian nation. It never has been truly a Christian mm -hmm. nation. Yeah. But he must be disappointed at the extreme immorality and what's happened even this year with homosexual marriage. He must just be so mm -hmm. sickened right. by the blessings that he showered on this country and the way that this country has just seemed to make a point to lay aside his word yeah. and and so when I pray that I pray but Lord remember me I'm not yeah. like America right. and and we should yeah. all pr feel like Nehemiah and pray like Nehemiah mm -hmm. did I think in the last chapter of yeah. the book so do we have any comments so far Emily? not yet okay mm -hmm. so we want your comments we really covet those so um, be sure you join in and comment because people will listen for a long time after tonight and it'll be more interesting to them and they'll learn more mm -hmm. if we get your comments as well okay so now let's dig in to the types of persecution that we found in the book of Nehemiah. And the first one was reproach because the nation looked bad to other nations that weren't nations of God. This is very real because here are people who don't believe in God all around Jerusalem, and they look at Jerusalem and the walls have fallen down. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was a reproach because they look bad. We know from chapter 1, verse 3, that it was shameful we know from chapter 2, verse 3, that it made Nehemiah downcast and sad. So what was his reaction in 1, verse 3, when it was shameful? What did he do well, he, um, about that? He says it, he sat down and wept and mourned for many days, is what my version says. Okay. Um, and says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Okay, so spiritually speaking, when we see that God's, church we're going to call we're going to compare this to the church mm -hmm. because we are the new yeah. jerusalem we are. and we are the spiritual israel and so when when there's sin in god's church when our spiritual walls have fallen down we should mourn mm -hmm. and we should weep and first corinthians 5 we should not glory in sin but rather it should make us ashamed yeah and it should make us weep and fast and pray and that's what nehemiah did in 1 verse 3 and then in 2 verse 3 we see that he was downcast before because of this he had a long mm -hmm. prayer in chapter 1 and then mm -hmm. the quick prayer in chapter 2 was his response so he prayed and then made a request of the king right I'd like to rebuild these walls king mm -hmm. and then in 2 17 we see that he was suffering um, mockery and derision there. Uh, go ahead and read 2.17 and go um, ahead and read on down through, um, let's read through 19. Okay. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. 
And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? Okay, we're going to get to the mocking part, but the suffering derision part there, um, it says in verse 17, um, I don't know how yours said, it, mm -hmm. reproach, I think. That's yes. the word mine uses. That, that Nehemiah was tired of them being a reproach. And I think mm -hmm. about that, and I think about, I know Nehemiah brought some people with him. But there was a remnant of people that had been there this whole time. Right. Priests, even, mm -hmm. that had been there this whole time, as far as we know, and they hadn't made an effort to rebuild right. those walls. It took this leadership of Nehemiah to say, let's build this wall. And, right. and in verse, by the time we get to verse 18, they said, let us rise up and build. Nehemiah mm -hmm. was influential as a leader. Right. And, and he was tired of this reproach, and, and he just said... He had a meeting, and they decided to rise up and build. Now, one other thing that I found in the book that I think looked bad to the outsiders was um, in chapter 5, verse 9. Go ahead and read that, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, uh, let's see. Maybe we uh, should read. Um, let's see. Maybe we should read verse 8 and 9. Okay. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what, are you, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? Okay, so what they were doing in these verses, in the context here, was overcharging their own brethren mm -hmm. with um, interest. Right. The, some of the people, um, obviously it was a bad time in Jerusalem, and they were, yeah. some of them were hungry, and they had to make loans from... Mm -hmm from the people who had enough. And so they were charging extra interest here and making life hard for their own brethren. And, and Nehemiah's point here is this looks bad to our enemies. Well, they were even having to sell their sons and daughters yeah, to and be said, slaves. So. It is not good. Um, and he said, it is not good that you do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? Even mm -hmm. our enemies know that this mm -hmm. is not the right thing to do. How does that apply today to the church? How does that apply to us in our communities? Well, it, it, um, the way that we look to the community and the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't allow, we can't allow sin in the church um, because it brings reproach upon the church. Yeah, and Jesus I mean, said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love, love. one to another. Mm -hmm. And the converse of that is true. If we, if we don't love one another, mm -hmm. they're going to know that we're not really his yeah. disciples. If, and that if, was, our, if our example, you know, is that we talk bad or we're bickering with those in the church or we're taking advantage of our brethren, then, I mean, that can't. That can't look good at yeah, all. Which is what, exactly the, what they were doing, right. taking advantage of their brethren. And so we see that um, Nehemiah then, following this, it says that he wept and he fasted and he prayed again. And then he protected and corrected. That's mm -hmm. what he tried to do was correct this situation, and he did correct it, and they repented. But he corrected and protected and said, let's don't look bad in front of our enemies. And right. that's what we should do today. I, I, I think of um, 1 Corinthians 6, and that's the chapter where uh, brethren were taking brethren to court. Mm -hmm. And Paul said, this, this should not yeah, happen right. because you're taking each other to court before unbelievers. And the words of Jesus come back again. By mm -hmm. this shall all men know that you're my Let's disciples see. if you have love one to another. And if you're fighting in front of the world, right? what a, what a bad scenario that is. Um, I think about also Galatians 6 verse 1 where it says that um, those who are spiritual should restore their brethren who are erring in the spirit of meekness. Mm -hmm. That means having a cause that's bigger than me. I'm going to try to to not um, be contentious with my erring brethren. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to them in the spirit of meekness. It says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Right. 
And so that is correction. That is biblical correction to keep mm-hmm. the body pure and to keep the body um, held in, in high esteem by mm-hmm. the community right. around it. So the next one then, do we have comments at no, all? No, not yet. Okay, the next <laughs> one then, then that we have is mocking. And we read to, did we read 219? We um, did. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so we have Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem jeering. Mm-hmm. And Nehemiah said, um, the Lord's going to prosper us, mm-hmm. and you will have no part in Jerusalem. I love, mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Um, that was his answer, and mm-hmm. he didn't mince words. Which, We're not worried about you. Right. God's going to prosper us, and you're not going to have any part in Jerusalem. Now, right. that didn't pan out exactly in the end because right. the, the people caved and gave them a part in Jerusalem. Ooh, yeah. But, but he also stands up to that yeah. and takes care and of that says, as well. Yeah. Later yeah. on, he's going to stand up to that. So he says you're not going to have a part in Jerusalem. He was strong in his language to those who were mocking and then in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we have some of the specifics of their mm-hmm. jeers, and they're not nice men. So mm-hmm. let's read 1 to 3. Uh, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, <coughs> that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. (laughs) They were kind of ruthless there. (coughs) And Mm -hmm. they were, I mean, you can just see them out there laughing. Oh, yeah. And making fun. It's sort of like the way we would imagine people laughing at Noah or... At, you know, at Christ, at the cross, mm-hmm. they were just making fun. At, look at what they're building. If a fox goes over there, he can knock that over. Right. Um, are they going to finish this in a day? Look, they're so mm-hmm. busy. It looks like they think they're going to finish this in one day. You know, right. I mean, they were just really ruthlessly mocking them. But what did, how did Nehemiah respond to that? Well, he, he prays. Um, and like he six, like he does. Yeah, and in verse six, so build <laughs> and, the wall. And he builds. He prays and he builds. He prays and he builds and he prays and he builds. If you just leave it's, tonight knowing no, he, that he we prays and pray builds. And build, <laughs> right. You know, then then we pretty much have summed up Nehemiah. Mm-hmm. He prays and builds. And so when people mock at us, what did Jesus tell us to do? Well, just to I'm, I'm trying to think of a specific verse. We but could that go you're, to, blessed are ye, right? when men shall persecute, persecute you, you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. We could go to, that's in Matthew, of course, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Let's look, um, we don't have time to look at both, so let's look at Luke chapter 6. Go ahead and read 22 and 23. Okay. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy for indeed your reward is great in heaven for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Yeah, and then let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 3 and 4. I think that might have the word mock in it. So 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 3 and 4. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they didn't think they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Okay, you what they're saying there is um, they think it's strange that you, mm-hmm. my King James Version says, that you run not to the same excess of riot. They say, mm-hmm. what's happened to you? How right. come you're, you're not, not one of this mm-hmm. gang anymore? So, um, and the, the one that has mocking in it that I love is in Acts chapter 2, where Peter was just about to, um, he was presenting the very first gospel sermon. And remember, it says, others mocking said, mm-hmm. These men are full of new wine. Right. And then Peter said, 
it is, we're not drunk, seeing it is but the third hour of the hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So what he did was he refuted, he denied the mm-hmm. charge, and Just when like, they when they were mocking him, he said, "This is not." This is this is real. This is mm-hmm. we're not drunk. This is what the prophet Joel said. I think about Jesus being mocked. Yeah, and the, the Bible clearly tells us that not only at the cross but through his lifetime, people mm-hmm. mocked him. And people, I remember it was almost the same accusation that they made for Peter. They said he's a wine bibber. Remember right. They 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 made right. some pretty stout mocking accusations against Jesus. And Jesus went on with the plan. Right. He just. But the apostles, you know, lived out what we just read in Luke 6 as well. Mm-hmm. You know, being released from prison, they were rejoiced because they, they, they were able to suffer. Um, you know, and so they, because they knew what that reward was. I mean, they lived that out. Yeah. You know, we see that in Acts um, yeah. as they and were John persecuted. The Baptist, yes. Who was really a prophet. He mm-hmm. was one of the prophets, but he, we, we, we see him being, and you know, they even, um, made, they made fun of his clothing, oh, even to yeah. Jesus. And they made yeah. fun of his Yeah. You ministry. know that they mocked him. They mocked him. Yes. yes. But he went all the way to the death. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that he went to the death standing against adultery. Right. And we, may in future generations, hopefully not ours, in America, go to the death as we oppose mm-hmm. sexual sin. Right. But that was the case with John the Baptist. So mm-hmm. great, great examples of how we respond to mocking. And then we have anger and threats. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's read four one and four seven. Uh, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And then in verse 7, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed that they became very angry. Yeah, they were very angry mm-hmm. because they wanted um, access to Jerusalem, and they did not like the sovereignty Mm -hmm. of God's nation coming back to Jerusalem. And they were indignant, as she read. They were angry. And um, when we read about their anger, we read that um, Nehemiah, once again, his response was to pray, to set up families with swords and spears and bows. He divided the workers from the watchers Mm -hmm. at times. And then the workers were building with swords in their other hands. There was no sign of when this anger came saying, oh, well, you know, now they're not just mocking. Now they're angry and we're afraid now they're threatening us. So maybe we should go undercover and maybe we should not. We'll we'll stop building for a while. There was none of that. Right. He redoubled his forces and said, we're doing this. But by doing that, he kind of. He, they realized, because it says in verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So by, by doing that, by keeping on going, I mean... Yeah, he, it, was, it was almost like um, they were trying something. They were saying, let's we're see just, if this works. Right, right. And they said, oh, this is it's not, not working. working. They're, gonna They're keep, going to keep right. building. And sometimes we back down when mm-hmm. if we would stand fast our enemies would well it is resist the devil and he He will flee from from you and sometimes we don't believe that enough and we think okay we'll just lay low for a little while but that is not that was not Nehemiah's response he just continued to build so I want us here I love the New Testament passages about this Um, let's look in Acts 4 Verses 27 to 31. And what's going on in Acts 3 to 5? Just, um, can you sum that up? Or he, um, the, uh, They've healed the lame man. At the temple. At the temple. And they got in big trouble. Mm-hmm. And it just keeps going on. Mm-hmm. The trouble just keeps yeah, going t- on. I mean, yeah. they, they say, okay, we're going to beat you. and then we're, But don't talk about Jesus anymore. And right. so they talk about Jesus some more. <laughs> right. And then, you know, they, they are imprisoned. And so we have them facing lots of anger here. And mm-hmm. let, let's go ahead and read uh, 
4, 27 to 31. Okay. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of Jesus through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Okay, there's boldness in there twice. twice. <laughs> yep. And once it's in the same verse with threatening. These mm -hmm. people were being threatened for their lives. Do not teach in the name right. of Jesus. And it says, so with boldness, they taught in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and I, I love that spirit of Nehemiah that they had there because what they did was pray and go ahead and go with the plan. But don't you think that's what inspires people? I mean, it's what inspired the people to keep going to Nehemiah, and it's what inspired people to become part of the church. Yeah, and it just kept growing. Because Yeah, and that, that's the only way you can explain it is the boldness and the standing fast. They could see that these people were not going to back down, and there's a reason for that. And so, Yeah, the very uh, next verse says, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it goes on and says in verse 33, and with great power, the apostles were giving witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Mm -hmm. You know, God's going to bless us when in the right. face of persecution we say we are not stopping. Mm -hmm. And that's that needs to apply to our evangelism. It needs to apply to our stand for morality. It needs to apply to our parenting. In all of those situations, we need to say we're going to be loyal to Christ no matter what this culture around us is mm -hmm. doing. We're not stopping. Well, and I even had... Um, after Stephen was stoned, um, you know, and it says in, in, at the beginning of eight, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church and they were all scattered. Um, but, um, you know, and Saul made havoc, but those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So, so we take those opportunities. We, that, that okay. You've, occur because you've moved of, us on, but we're uh, going to keep, you yeah, know, we're going to keep doing. And that's, that's the way it's going to be. You know, in our country, if our country falls one day, so we're in a different situation. But mm -hmm. we're still going to be citizens of heaven, right. and we're going to keep on going. I love that. I, I wanted to mention some more, but I, I know that we are going to run out of time if we mention all of these. But from Acts 4, we learned that they responded with boldness. In Acts 8, which she mentioned mm -hmm. Stephen, they responded by, he responded by keeping on to the the death. The very end. The mm -hmm. very end. And so what if we die? I, you know, I know that's doesn't sound exactly right to say in our culture, but so what if we die? Mm -hmm. We're going to go to a better place and we're going to be blessed because we were, we stood fast blessed. to the end. Right. So, um, and then I, Acts 5 is the same story that we were reading, but I love verses 28 to 42. Wow, we can't read all of that. But in those, mm -hmm. um, you know, they said, didn't we command you not to teach? And they said in verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then they gave this powerful exposition similar to Acts 2 um, and um they rejoiced, verse four, mm -hmm. 41, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Right. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus as the Christ. So they responded by keeping on, keeping on. Um, in Acts 12, I love Acts 12 as well. Um, this is where Herod had killed James. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, we're talking about anger and threatening here. Mm -hmm. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he took Peter also. And he apprehended him and he put, it in, put him into prison. And Peter was kept in prison. But how did the saints respond in verse 5? Um, they were in constant prayer. Yeah, they prayed without ceasing earnestly. Mm -hmm. And so Herod was going to bring him forth. And in verse 7, the angel of the Lord came and smote Peter on the side and raised him up, and Peter was able to escape that prison. Mm -hmm. um, and then we read in Acts 16, and you know this one. This mm -hmm. is where um, 
it was the prison. This is where the uh, jailer, the Philippian jailer, was in Acts 16. And we read verse 25, and we read their response to being in prison. Um, it says that they had been thrust into the inner prison, and their feet were fast in the stocks. And verse 25 says, go ahead and read were, that. Um, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening okay. to them. And we know that was a great earthquake then, and the result of that was more conversions in the city of Philippi. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move on to financial distress, but do you have comments? Yes, I do. Okay. Go okay. Ahead. All right. Um, Christina Odom says, a way to defeat persecution is to keep on working. Get your mind right and focus on your task at hand. Your task is needful for your spiritual protection and growth. Um, I don't know if I'm going to say her name right. Do Tanya you? McCready. Okay, Tanya. Okay. Always make me think, this always makes me think of Noah versus Elijah. Both were standing alone in mocking arena. Contrast Elijah's response, run and hide. I'm the only one left with Noah's. Noah did all that God commanded. Um, and then uh, Genevieve just says, I needed to hear these things. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, we all need to hear them today. Okay, so those are great comments. And uh, I love what Tanya said about, you know, Elijah got discouraged. And sometimes, as opposed to Noah, just Noah did all that God commanded him. And, mm -hmm. and so that makes, we heard about Elijah Sunday morning. That we was did. our lesson. Mm -hmm. And he did get discouraged. But the important thing to remember is that, and, and he was, again, we're talking about anger and threatenings, right. and he was. I mean, Jezebel said, you're going to be dead by this time tomorrow. <laughs> right. And and she was the most powerful woman in the country. Mm -hmm. And she, so he was operating under threat there. But the important thing is that when we get discouraged, we like Elijah, listen to the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we hear him say, I have 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to bow. Right. And we realize that we are not alone. Mm -hmm. And we're never alone. Even if there aren't 7,000, we mm -hmm. have God on our side. So then we have financial distress. We talked about this a little bit in chapter 5. The Jews were overcharging each other, and some of them were suffering. And Nehemiah responded that by responded to that by getting a pledge from the priest to stop mm -hmm. this high interest and then it says, how many people did he feed at his own 150. table? 150. 150. And we get the menu even right. in Nehemiah of what he was feeding those 150 people. Right. So what Nehemiah's response was, we're going to stop taking advantage of each other. And I'm going to take care of as many as I can mm -hmm. personally. That, that needs to be our response. When our brethren are suffering, we need to be sure yeah. that we're doing what we can personally Step, right. to alleviate that suffering. We have examples of that in Acts 2. When mm -hmm. at the end of that chapter, it says they had all things common because there was a persecution right. in Jerusalem and there were people who were needy. We have it again in Acts uh, 6 where the, the first deacons were charged to take care of the widows who were in need. We have that all through the New Testament. We have it in um, first, Second Corinthians chapter 8. Mm -hmm. That's where um, it says that uh, they were liberal because they first gave their hearts. Right. And that's um, what we have to do. If our hearts are given to Jesus, then we're doing the Matthew 25 thing, mm -hmm. which says that when we do it to the least of these, our brethren, when we take care of their needs when they're hungry or thirsty or in prison or sick, and we take care of their needs, that we're doing it to the to Lord him. Jesus. Right. And I, I love that passage. Um, one of our listeners tonight, I know she's listening because she's commented, um, has a friend who um, is away from home right now suffering in a cancer center. And um, just because we're away from, I think her husband wasn't able to go with her, so she's pretty much alone in this mm -hmm. city. And um, when we think about being away from our physical family or even the spiritual family that we know, we should, like this woman has, has done, we should feel comfortable relying on our spiritual family mm -hmm. that we've never met in whatever city we find ourselves. Right. And so today I spent some time contacting an elder in the city. It's in Atlanta, actually, in the city where she is. And I, I called my son who lives in the suburb of Atlanta. And I said, who do you know in the city that's close to this cancer center? And it took us about 10 minutes to find someone that we love who responded back in about 10 minutes and said, 
my wife will go after work tomorrow, and then the rest of the elders and I will go later in the week and pray with her. What a blessing is the yes. family of God. Really and is. that's what... That's what Nehemiah was saying here. We're going to care for each other. Uh, we read in the book of James, chapter 5. Mm -hmm. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl, re, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries because your garments are moth-eaten and your riches are corrupted. Riches are, are neither good nor bad. Right. But they are misery causers yeah. according to James 5 when we are neglecting to use mm -hmm. them to take care of our brethren they were taking James 5 is the New Testament example of what was happening in Nehemiah 5 right because they were uh, there were rich men among them who were taking advantage and not paying their laborers what they should have paid them right and there's a strong condemnation mm -hmm. of that so we as God's people care about each other again going to go to what Jesus said this is the way that all men are going to know that you mm -hmm. Love me if you have love one to another. Okay, so then we go. To, we get to deceit. Oh, we're almost out of time. <laughs> Sambella and Tobiah in chapter 6 made up and spread lies about Nehemiah wanting to be a king. And his response to that was to deny that mm -hmm. and go on building. He prayed for strength. He denied those allegations. He said, God, give me strength, even when they're saying these lies about me. And he went on building. And then in chapter 10, Shemaiah, who was hired by Sambala and Tobiah, come, Tobiah, comes to Nehemiah and acts like he's his friend and says, you know, uh, you need to lock yourself up in the house of God because some of your enemies really want to get you. Right. So you need to take care of yourself and lock yourself up in the house of God. So Nehemiah went in there and hid, right? No. <laughs> he did not go in there and hide. He said, um, you know, I'm going to pray for the defeat of my enemies. And once again, we find yeah. him praying. And I like what he says in verse, should such a man as I flee? Yeah, <laughs> and he was like, um, I, I just, he was brave. He was just Yeah, so and he says, and who brave. is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. I will not go in the <laughs> I temple. will not he, go in. He was not, um, you know, I kind of think he had an idea that they were hired people, right. you know. Yeah. But even right. if he, he, did, he yeah. just said, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I've listened to you now, but your idea is not a good one. And I'm not going to do this. And I love, I love his candor and the way that he just thought on his feet. Mm -hmm. And um, it, he just, and prayed. Every single Every time. time he prayed. Yeah. We as women of God just really need to take advantage of the power that there is in our decision-making moments of prayer. Mm -hmm. It is just such a powerful tool that we sometimes neglect. I think it's real important to notice here, though, that sometimes people who seem to care about us, like this man was acting like he <laughs> cared about Nehemiah, sometimes people who really are sincere in caring about us, give us bad advice. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to think about this a lot because... And this is just, I probably shouldn't even give personal examples, but my doctor just wants me to quit traveling. Just, will you just quit traveling? She keeps telling me, you know, you just need to, I know that you think you're helping people, but <laughs> you just need to rest. Rest is what you really need. And you need to stop going on all these trips. And, you know, but my doctor doesn't have a clue about what's important to me. Right. You know, she doesn't know anything about eternity I mm -hmm. mean she doesn't she doesn't have the same view that I have of what's mm -hmm. important in this life and I have to remind myself of that now I don't want to abuse my body and I right. want to take care of myself and I try to take care of myself but I have to leave her office and think hmm, yeah. she just she, she just doesn't, doesn't really know what she I'm doesn't about get it yeah she doesn't know that I really don't care I'll say it again, but I really don't care if I die. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> going to die, you know. Right. Everybody's going to die of something. And I, I, I'm not saying that I really don't care if I die. I want to live and I want to see grandchildren and all those things. And I want to take care of myself because this is the, the temple of the Holy right. Spirit. I want to do all those things. But my doctor doesn't know what's important. 
mm-hmm. to me. And so we have to take that into account sometimes. And that's just something that I threw in for free. Okay, and then we have faults. Uh, do we have comments? Um, Tanya just said, oh, Nehemiah's, on Nehemiah's being brave, like the adage, courage is fear that, ha- that has said its prayers. Yeah. <laughs> and he said his prayers. And so, you know, whatever he had to be fearful of, and, oh, we need this. We need it so badly. When we pillow our heads at night, we need to say to God, you know, I don't have this by myself. Mm-hmm. I can't do this by myself. But, Lord, help me to remember that you and I can do all things. And right. that's well, what, it's committing, committing your plans to the Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge yes. him, and right. he will direct your path. It's, mm-hmm. it's a promise. Mm-hmm. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay, and then we have the false accusations. Sambal and Tobiah are accusing Nehemiah of doing all this so he can be a king. You always want to be a king. And um, there's an answer for that. Um, he denied it, mm-hmm. and he prayed. And I wish I had time to, to talk about the examples of that, but I love Paul. Mm. In 2 Corinthians 10 to 12, they were saying, you're not really an apostle, you just want the glory. Mm-hmm. That's really in a nutshell, the accusation against Paul, the same as with Nehemiah. And he denied that allegation and spent a whole chapter in Second Corinthians 11 saying, here are the persecutions that I've been through for the cause of Christ. And he said, I don't want to glory in myself. I want to glory in the Lord. But if you'll permit me for a minute to just mm-hmm. deny this allegation. And right. he went on and did that. And so I, I don't think it's wrong for us to say, this is not true. Right. Okay, and then we have treason, and I really think that the treason from within was probably the most hurtful to Nehemiah of all the persecutions that he faced. Because in chapter 6, verses 17 to 19, we find Jews were loyal to Tobiah. They were communicating with him, and they had, um, they had allowed... In fact, some of them were being spies Mm -hmm. for the enemy, spies for Tobiah. And in uh, 13, verses 4 to 8, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, the priest, Eliashib, Eliashib, I think, is um, allied with Tobiah. Mm -hmm. These people inside Jerusalem are making alliances with the enemy. And um, how did Nehemiah respond to this. I love how he responded to this. Well, in the first one, he um, set watches, and then in 13, he he throws Tobiah out. Yeah, he cast out I mean, all he, of his stuff right. and cleansed the chamber. So what had happened in 13 was that while he was gone, this priest of God had let Tobiah, who was kin to a bunch of the people, mm-hmm. what verses? Give them the verses just so they can look at um, that. Um, oh, the ones that we read. Show that he's kin. In, uh, well, 6, um, verse eight, uh, 18. Okay, it says that he's all tied in with these people yeah. in Jerusalem. Tobiah. He's the son-in-law. The enemy. Of, of um, it, it appears it's... Tobiah. Tobiah, okay. right. Yeah. And in verse 18. Yeah, and yeah. So, so there he is, all tied in in a family relationship now, and he's moved his stuff into the court Mm -hmm. of the temple of God. He's living in the court of the temple of God, the one who was the mocker, the one who was the uh, threatener, the Mm -hmm. one who was the liar, the one who was the deceiver, is living in the court. And Nehemiah comes back and throws him out. Yeah. You know, I don't think Nehemiah was wimpy in any way. And then we read... um, well, um, and them letting him live in the temple, they let him live. It says, you know, they put him in a place where they had stored the grain offerings and all the things that, and also the things that, that, that were commanded to be given to the Levites. So later on in chapter 13, he says, I realized that the portions for the Levites weren't being given to them. So they were <laughs> forsaking the doctrine in that way yeah. because they had let Tobiah live. And so when he cleanses, when he cleans him out, he puts the stuff back in yeah. that should have been there in the first and place. you know who's probably eating that stuff. I <laughs> yes. mean, you know, he was, yeah. he was the one who was right. getting to so live the Levites. in the place of the sacrifices that they were supposed right. to be so giving the Levites. So the Levites were going without and because they had cleaned out that room and yeah. let him live there. So. And, yeah, uh, it was amazing 
the extent to which mm-hmm. it went. We'll talk about um, Sam Ballot's part in that too in just a minute. But before we get to that, uh, I wanted to mention um, the treason from within today. People who are inside the church and turn away from it are like a dog who returns to his vomit mm. and a pig who comes back to her wallowing in the mire. That's what God thinks about his people. That's what he thought about the people in Nehemiah's day because, you know, they went through all of this to, to sanctify themselves, to separate themselves, we read. And then Nehemiah went away for a little while. It reminds me of Joshua. You know, as long right. as Joshua lived, they could be separate. Mm-hmm. But Nehemiah went away for a little while, and he comes back, and they've returned to the vomit. Right. I mean, they've gone right back to where they were. And I, I think about Demas. We read about Demas who, um, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and how that he um, forsook Paul because he loved this world too mm-hmm. much. Um I read about the church of, at Ephesus in the seven churches of Revelation and how that they left the first love. Mm-hmm. And in 1 Corinthians 5, we read about what's to be done about sin in the camp. Don't glory in it. Don't be, you know, they could have been excited. Tobiah is what, well, uh, he was a governor. Right. He's well known in this land. Let's just welcome him on in here and make alliances with his people and we'll be stronger. You know, they, they could have been, I mean, they were glorying mm-hmm. in that. They replaced what was belonged to the Levites with this liar. Mm-hmm. And they were, it reminds me of politics today. You know, they were putting him, this liar, in an esteemed position and that's like 1 Corinthians 5. They've got a man living with his father's wife, and God says, stop glorying in that, and you've got to get rid of the impurity and fix this. And so that is a New Testament example of kind of right. the same thing. It is. Okay, we're, we're going to run out of time. We have run out of time, but let's quickly uh, mention that they were forsaking true doctrine. They weren't keeping the Sabbath. Uh, they had unqualified priests, priests and um Nehemiah in chapter 7 declared these unqualified priests um, to um, as polluted mm-hmm. and put them out of the priesthood. I mean, if it was broken, Nehemiah could be counted on to fix it. Um, I love that. And that's in 7, 63 and 64. In 8, 13 to 17, they weren't keeping the Feast of Booths, and they understood that they weren't. And so he reestablished that feast. And it says they were reading daily from the Word. I love that word, Mm -hmm. daily. We need to be reading daily from the Word. And then in 13, 1 to 3, this is after Nehemiah went away. And when he came back, um, the Levites' portions hadn't been duly given, as we talked about. And they were profaning the Sabbath. Uh, I love what he did about the Levites' portions. It says he contended with the rulers. Mm -hmm. Uh, That reminds me of contend earnestly for the faith, Mm -hmm. the faith. He um, argued. Contend means to Mm -hmm. argue, to stand up for. He stood up against the rulers and righted that wrong and prayed that God would remember him for good. We've always got him praying. And in 13, 15 to 18, about profaning the Sabbath, what did he do about that? He... um, well, we'll see. He contended with them again, the uh, nobles, with the nobles yeah. of Judah, and said to them, "What is what is this evil um, that you are doing?" And then he, I love how he reminds them, "Did not your fathers mm-hmm. do this? Mm-hmm. And did not our God bring?" Are you going back to the same thing? Oh, well, that's what I kept thinking last mm-hmm. night when we when we did our study. Is you know we're. I mean, like, do you, did you see the rubbish laying around mm-hmm. us? I mean, but just do we think have to? about him going back and shutting that gate mm-hmm. at dark before the Sabbath. I mean, he was well, a bold man. I know, and I love how it says in the merchants and the sellers, they waited outside of Jerusalem once or twice, and then he warned them, and they didn't come back. Yeah, yeah, he <laughs> you was know? so brave. <laughs> yeah. he, he just was. Because he, he said, I will lay hands on you if you come back. And they knew what his laying hands on meant because they had watched Tobiah be <laughs> kicked out of that city, you know. Right. And he, they knew what that meant. And then, um, then in... Um, conclusion, I guess. I hate to conclude because there's so much I want to say about Nehemiah, but um, lastly, the outsiders brought temptation very close in, and we talked about 
um, Tobiah, but in 13, 23 to 27, the people of God had taken strange right. wives. Yeah. And what was his reaction to that? <laughs> well, this time he contended with them, but he also struck them. Cursed them. Cursed them and pulled their hair out. <laughs> he pulled out their hair. <laughs> I just really would love to have seen that. Those yeah. people who are married to the strange wives getting well, their hair pulled out. And then it says he made them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters as wives mm -hmm. to their son, nor mm -hmm. take their daughters. Mm -hmm. I just, I mean, <laughs> that part about pulling the hair out, <laughs> no. just, it makes me just really realize how serious God is about our yes. sanctification. Yes. He is serious about sanctification. And then in uh, 28, this is a different occasion of, um, this is Sam Bell at this time, and his son-in-law when Nehemiah came back, was a priest. Mm -hmm. Sanballat's son-in-law was a priest. Now, Sanballat and Tobiah were Ammonite and Moabite. And here we've got a foreign priest who is not only foreign, but is the arch enemy of the people of God. His son-in-law is a priest in the temple. Uh, it says Nehemiah chased him away chased him away. Uh, people right. were watching him, chased right. him away. And I guess he had to chase him away on a day that was not Saturday because the gate would be closed, <laughs> closed on Saturday. Right. So um, he, uh, this was the son of um, Eliashib, the priest who had also lodged Tobiah. Mm -hmm. So they were very cozy with the Samballot family and the Tobiah family. This reminds me of the Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, where she was causing God's people to commit fornication. And the people of God were letting outsiders influence them in sexual relationships just like this, mm -hmm. these people. And uh, God, God was not pleased with that. So um, we have, um, uh, let's just, uh, I, I really, uh, I don't want to stop, but let's look at one more passage of Scripture. In the middle of the book, when they were, um, when they heard the words of the Lord, let's read, Emily, read chapter 8, verse 12. Okay. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. I love that. Mine says to make great mirth. Mm -hmm. They were happy. Because the word of God had been read again and they had understood it. And then let's read 2 and 3 of the next chapter. Chapter 9 verses um, 2 and 3. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners. And they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God. For one fourth of the day and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Okay, so here's the sequence. They studied... And then they separated themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they confessed their sins and they worshiped. When we study, we're going to want to not be like the world. We're, we're going to want to confess that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world and that we're done with sin. And then we're going to worship God because that is going to give us the abundant life. I love right. that. Right. And then um, I really wanted to look at Malachi chapter 4 because he was contemporary with Nehemiah. And in Malachi chapter 4, the, the Old Testament is closes by saying, we know it's hard right now. He's talking to those Jews in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I know your lives are hard right now. Things have not been so good. But there's coming a day when God is going to send the Savior. He talks about he's going to send Elijah, Elijah, which is John the Baptist, and there's going to... just Do you see those pretty verses there? Read a little bit for us. Yeah. Um, Malachi chapter 4, <laughs> contemporary with Nehemiah, talking to the same people that Nehemiah was working with. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Okay. And there are verses above that, mm -hmm. too, that describe the coming of the Messiah. There oh, right. is. Go ahead. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. 
on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. I love it. Mm -hmm. He just closes the Old Testament by saying, there's a great day coming. I'm sending my Messiah. And aren't we blessed to live Mm -hmm. in the era when the Messiah has come? I love that. Um, Well, hmm. we wanted to take time to talk about some modern day instances of persecution that threatenings and anger that come to the people of God. I think you looked up uh, several yeah, and I, I brought some things as well. And we hope that you've been looking at home. What I, I brought had to do with the sin of homosexuality, which is um, one of, if not the most prevalent, um, I guess, platform for uh, upcoming persecution. Mm-hmm. I believe it to be. And I think that you had an instance where kids one. were, tell, tell us about that, the badges. Um, there was a, there's a high school in California where about a dozen students are wearing badges that have the, the rainbow and I guess it has like a, like a circle and then a, you know, a, and, you know, mark through Which it, means like against. the red against. And so um, they're wearing the rainbow, the LGBT T. rainbow mm-hmm. with the, symbol above it that X's right. it out so that they're making a statement against really against homosexual marriage right. and against homosexual well and that and, and and evidently well in that community I guess there are a lot in that school that are part of the LGBT mm-hmm. community and so it's offensive to them but the school is holding up that these students can do this because of the the right to speech but they're being Mocked. But yeah, they're they're saying that how you know it's offensive, it's hate speech, um, you know, and that it's um, you know, and the comments underneath were just mocking, mm. you know. And one of the examples that I brought is even the word homophobe. The word mm. homophobe uh, is applied so often to those of us who will quote the Bible, Mm -hmm. clear scripture about the sinfulness of homosexuality. And we're called homophobes just because we think homosexuality is a sin. Right. When the word phobe is phobia, of course, and it is fear. And um, that's an incorrect mocking terminology Mm -hmm. even to, um, to be called homophobes because we recognize that the Bible condemns the sin of homosexuality. Right. Um, I was listening to a speech by Sheila Butt, a representative in Tennessee, uh, one of our sisters in Christ, about um, she made a statement, and this it wasn't even about uh, really homosexuality. It was about um, the Muslim community and about how that um, there there are um, organizations that are are in place now to protect um, Muslims and to um, help communities understand the Muslim community. And she just made a statement, uh, sometimes Christians need, maybe we as Christians need that sort of organization to help people understand us. You know? <laughs> yeah. She just made that simple statement. And by the end of the day, she had folks looking through her, um, all the books that she had written and uh, finding her her mm. book that she wrote for children about homosexuality. And um and saying all sorts of hateful, hateful language that you could not even use. And that's just one other, one example of how that um, there is on the horizon persecution Mm -hmm. for God's people. And it is already, it, it is at the door. It is. And so we, as God's people, want to look at Nehemiah and say, we can pray, separate ourselves, and build and mm-hmm. restore what God wants to be restored. And even if our nation fails, His spiritual Israel is a forever nation. Mm-hmm. And we can go to heaven as part of that nation. Do we have other comments? And then we're done. <laughs> um, just a few. Genevieve, um, I guess when we were talking about him like pulling out the hair... She says in Numbers 25-7, when Phinehas takes the spear and and killed um, them before the congregation. Mm. Um, And then Tanya says, we get to see what the people in Hebrews 11-13 only had, quote, seen and greeted from afar. 
seeking oh, that's, a, we're a, a part homeland. of this new nation. Right. And it even says that in so Hebrews grateful. eleven thirteen. It says, you know, that um, those people were seeking a better mm-hmm. country. That's the mm-hmm. quote that it used. And it says, mm-hmm. we... We get, get to, to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like, um, oh, I don't know what to describe it, how to describe it. It's like, though, that, uh, you know, people have looked forward and looked forward and looked forward to this time. And there have been types and shadows. And we get the real thing. Right. And that's just such a blessing. It is. Is that all that we have? That's it. Okay. We are going to close with prayer. <laughs> I hope that you'll join us next time as we talk about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And I believe that that podcast is going to be on March 22nd. I know earlier it said March 29th, I think, on the site. But I I think that's going to be on March 22nd. Watch the website. Watch the Facebook page. But right now, tentatively, we're going for March 22nd for that podcast. So be sure and join us. Thank you so much, Emily, for doing this. And we'll, we'll close with prayer. Father, we are just so very thankful that we are a part of the new Jerusalem, that we are a part of your spiritual Israel, that we are spiritual children of Abraham, and that we have the confidence that whatever occurs, both in this important and influential election day and in succeeding days in our country america and in the in the other lands where women are listening whatever occurs in in the nations of this world you are sovereign and you have promised protection to us we can always be refugees in your hands father in the cities that you've prepared for us and that we will Find safety and refuge in your church. And it will be safety that will safely bring us over Jordan and into the eternal promised land. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to constantly be grateful for that. To exude our gratitude in the decisions that we make every day. That we will be happy people like obviously like Nehemiah was and that we'll be brave people like Nehemiah was and like uh, Peter and John were when when it the scripture keeps telling us that they kept on saying it with boldness and help us father to be bold we know that um, there are places in our land today where people come after you if you are speaking about the sin of homosexuality already father And we pray, Father, that you will help us, no matter what the sin is, to continue to uh, speak in kindness but in boldness your word. And help us, Father, to align our own lives and our families' lives with your word. And help us, Father, to keep in our heart the hope that closed the the Old Testament, Father, that... uh, there was going to be a Messiah and that he was going to come forth from the grave and he was going to conquer. And we are so thankful that we are today in the kingdom that he purchased with his blood and that we have that hope. Help us put that hope in the hearts of our children and our grandchildren and help us, Father, to never, never leave or forsake you. And Help us, Father, to keep the vows that we made when we were baptized that we will live our lives for you and help us to one day be around your throne. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We're stuck.